Well, good evening, London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Have you ever heard of Mr Beast? What about PewDiePie? How about Keemstar, Logan Paul, Jake Paul? The answer might well be no, that you haven't heard of them. But if you've got kids, you will definitely have heard of them, and they most certainly have. They're just a tiny handful of the legions of digital personalities whose videos are viewed by literally billions of young people across the world. Their endorsements are worth millions in sales. Their opinions can instantly reshape conversations in schools, universities and across social media. They're more influenced than most musicians, soap stars, sports stars, columnists, lawmakers. But unlike those power brokers of the past, the politicians and cultural stars who could set the social agenda, these people seem to exist in a parallel universe. Their views go largely unchallenged, shared only as bite-sized clips. Their digital businesses often operate beyond the scrutiny of normal journalists and even regulators. They wield massive influence over young people and they're restricted only by the ever-changing whims of big tech companies. It makes no more sense than senators or secretaries of state simply never appearing on television. Well, my guest tonight is a perfect case in point, an example of both enormous digital conquest and the risks that come with it. He's Andrew Tate. His last interview with me has so far been viewed well, over 8 million times on YouTube alone and 17 million times across all platforms, which is staggering for someone who perhaps you're watching and thinking, who is Andrew Tate? It was a robust exchange. And Andrew Tate was here because he'd effectively been kicked off the mainstream internet for supposed misogyny. His tirades against women were viewed literally billions of times. Well, the first time around, I wanted to find out if he deserved to be banned and if he'd ever actually crossed a line from shocking opinions to genuine hate speech, or if he just didn't fit the ideal model of the platforms that censored him. Let's go through some. Sure. Right? Do you think women are the property of men? No. The point I was why, making... Why have you said they are? Because I made a religious point. Authority implies that you have the ability to control someone. No, movements. authority believes... Uh, the Authority implies that I have the moral right to sit and say that that's an irresponsible thing to do and I'm responsible that's for... That's not what things. authority means. I don't want to interrupt you. I just want to point out that's not what authority means. If someone gives... you can A person can give Voluntary authority. authority is not authority. Uh, no, but that's the point. If it's a not. Woman, Piers. Andrew, stop. And let this me, is the thing that's interesting, Piers. Please let me finish. Are you, again, you're Please. behaving like a politician. But hang on. You can say I'm interrupting. You do. But, if, but you're answering a different question to the one I asked you. Fine. No, no. The you're point... weaponizing the weaponizing, which no doesn't problem. exist. No problem. If someone comes to me and says I'm clinically depressed or I feel very, very sad, I would say the first thing you need to do is stop accepting the identity of a clinically depressed person. Stop accepting you have no control over this. Andrew, you're simply wrong. If that's what you believe, Piers, it's, it's what not. I believe. I don't believe in things that take power away. There from. is not an eminent doctor in the world Piers, that would agree with you. Piers, do you I, think you know more than doctors? I can't become clinically depressed. Why do you know? Because I don't believe in it. It's a lively stuff. I also wasn't sure if I should be interviewing him at all. If he was so unpleasant, as so many people said, well, why extend his profile and give him a platform? But the fact is that that ship had already sailed. Every teenager in the country knows Andrew Tate. It's just a lot of the parents who don't. And since that interview. Andrew has been returned to Twitter. This new owner, Elon Musk, is determined to perfect, protect free speech online. Many young people, especially boys, have literally stopped me in the street since that first interview to ask me about Andrew Tate. I've been staggered, honestly, by the response that I've had. What does it say about society that people like Andrew Tate can reach so many more people than conventional stars or journalists even? Who gets to decide where the line is and whether people like Andrew Tate cross it? Are they part of a poorly understood movement that panders to teenage rebellion like punk rock or pornography? Or are we exposing young people to new and damaging experiences we often don't see and don't understand? It's a whole new world. There are more questions about it than answers, and we're not going to answer them by pretending it doesn't exist. Well, Andrew Tate joins me again now. Andrew, good to see you. Salam alaikum, Pierce. Good to see you. I've, I've genuinely been amazed by the reaction I've had in the streets, not just here, but I went to Qatar for the World Cup, had the same thing there. A lot of people coming up about Cristiano Ronaldo, obviously, but also a lot of people coming up about you. And they were almost exclusively men, young men, who genuinely see you as a role model, as somebody who inspires them, as somebody they want to be like. Yeah. So it made me think, I, the first interview you had was quite combative, the second time, uh, a shorter interview, less so. I want to try and work out, in this one, who you are, because it struck me as extraordinary that Google this week revealed some stats for the year. The number one person whose name followed people Google searching who is 
in 2022 was Andrew Tate. Yeah, that's quite remarkable. I think there's a whole swath of the population, especially young men, that feel disenfranchised. They feel disenfranchised with the media machine and the things they're supposed to believe. They don't feel an affinity with the educational systems or the culture. And they look at a person like me who stands up and says the things that many young men think. I haven't put a magic spell on the world. The fact that people like what I say means that they agree with me deep inside. They may be afraid to say it themselves, but I am seen as a bastion of free speech and a bastion, bastion for masculinity as a whole because a lot of men are largely forgotten about. Do you think you're a force for good or are you a force in evolution where perhaps you've done and said stuff you shouldn't have done and as you get older, perhaps as you get bigger, more followed around the world, you sense a responsibility perhaps you didn't have early on? Well, we all evolve. Every human evolves day by day. You wouldn't be human if you didn't evolve on an hour by hour basis. But I do not think I'm a force for good. I absolutely not really know I'm a force for good because I'm a force for truth. And truth is a good thing. Without truth, we're gonna end up in absolute tyranny and slavery and we're already on our way there. I feel like we're starting to combat it. My cancellation was the beginning of a change in public consciousness. Elon having Twitter is another beginning of the change in public consciousness. And anybody who stands up and speaks what they truly believe, even if it's something I don't personally agree with, I think that truth is absolutely important and people's personal truths and people's personal opinions, even on differing sides of the same opinion, should be heard. Tell me about your life. You were born to a, a mixed race uh, couple. Your yeah. father was an African-American, a chess player. Yeah. Uh, and your mother, she was from this country. Correct, yeah. So my father was was black chess player. He was in the Air Force. He met my mother here in England. And then I was raised initially in the United States. And then I moved to, to Luton, England when I was younger. So I've moved around a lot. I've lived a uh, eclectic life in many different scenarios. We've moved around. I've done a lot of different things, lived a lot of different experiences. And uh, what I'm thankful for What nationality are you? I mean, what do you identify as? I consider myself British now, but I will say that part of me, the patriotic Britain side of me, is devastated by the state of the UK currently, and I want to make that very clear. The patriotic Britain me truly loves this country, and seeing what's happening to it, especially to our major cities, is almost heartbreaking to watch in real time. In what way? Uh, it's falling apart. This is a failed society. By every metric you can possibly measure, it is absolutely utterly failing. The cost of living crisis, the crime rates, everything is falling apart. If you compare it to a country like the United Arab Emirates, you compare it to a city like Dubai, London, which should be the greatest city on earth, is failing in absolutely every metric because our leadership is a joke. If you look at Dubai and the UAE, the leadership there is so flawless, so genuinely genius. They saw ahead and built an almost a utopia. And then you look at London, you can't even walk around with a watch on. It's disgusting. You know, it's very interesting. I was in Qatar for the World Cup. Obviously, a lot of people in England taking a very censorious moral view about the World Cup being in the Middle East at all because of their laws against homosexuality, because of their treatment of migrant workers. I've got to say, not that I don't share the concerns about those things. Of course I do. But I found a lot of the virtue signalling and I think that's what it was in many cases, about the whole region, actually quite distasteful. Because when I was in Qatar, A, I thought the World Cup was fantastically well run, incredibly good experience. But a lot of Qataris were saying to me, you know, there's this weird quaint feeling back in your country that we all want to aspire to behave like that, that we all want to ha live in a country with massive drug problems, with massive knife crime issues, with scenes like the European Championships final where it's complete lawlessness going on, um, where stuff like the NHS, the system of healthcare, is basically collapsing, yep. where the education system is dropping behind, yep. so on and so on and so on. And it's a really interesting perspective. They were like, I know you all think that we want to have your form of democracy and your form of life, but actually, we're fine, thanks. Absolutely, because it's a failed society and it's godless. I think it's disgusting. We leave our old people to rot in old people's homes and then we sit there and say we don't have enough money for nurses. I understand this nurse strike very well and how frustrating it can be if you walk into a hospital and the nurse is not prepared to work. But the nurses would be prepared to work at the current wage if they believed this country was spending its money prudently. When you see this country spending its money and just absolutely wasting it, pulling out of thin air to fund proxy wars, God knows where, that has nothing to do with them. Of course, as a nurse, you're going to stand up and say, well, can't I get a pay rise? This country has failed on every metric. And especially our major cities. I, I've just come to London now. I made it very clear to my private jet pilot. I said, fuel the jet and leave it running because the second I'm finished talking to peers, I'm leaving this cesspit. It's disgusting. This country and London as a whole 10 years ago was one of the most hospitable cities on earth. Now you cannot walk around safely with a watch on. 
and you're a full-grown man, you're a full-grown adult. When's the last time there's been a serious problem in your life that you completely ignored and it fixed itself? Never, ever. What are any of our politicians doing to fix any of the problems we're well, genuinely Well, I saw facing? today that Sadiq Khan is planning to run again for the third term of office as mayor. All I can say is I just... Everyone I know who's had any experience of crime at any level in London in the last few years has had a bad experience of it, of the way it's been handled. You know, I mean, I can give an example. I can reveal this now. I've talked for 18 months. I got a specific death threat on one of my son's Instagram pages in public, a, a, a public comment. And it was very specific about what this person was going to do. Yeah. I couldn't use the police to evade him. We, we know where you live. We're going to come and kill you. And then a the second one, threatening uh, my son and his mo mother, my ex-wife. I called in the police. I thought, I'm not having them putting death threats on my son's For Sure. I called the police. Police investigated this. They arrested somebody over a year ago. And then I heard from the police this week that despite 18 months of investigation, of a publicly posted comment on Instagram threatening to kill me uh, on my son's Instagram, that they ha will not be able to pursue the case. Now, and I thought, imagine, I'm high profile. This was a front page of the Sun newspaper, this if story. If that same man called a transgender person the wrong pronouns, he would be in trouble. Right. So doesn't it just show absolute, how absolutely asinine and banal our legal system has become? That would never happen in a country like United Arab, Emir United Arab Emirates, the place I'm now residing in Dubai, where the leadership has common sense. And I'm saying that all the leadership structures, doesn't matter if it's labor or conservative, across all of it in this nation have completely mm -hmm. and utterly failed. Sadiq Khan is a loser. Because when you have a city which is losing... Which, which London is, is losing in all, very, in all metrics across its competitive cities around the world, mm -hmm. and you're in charge of it, by extension, you're a loser. I will tell you right now, instead of virtue signaling and giving Qatar a hard time over their religious beliefs, what we should be doing is a treaty with Qatar to build a prison deep in the desert. Give me, make me mayor of London. We'll make a prison deep in the desert, and if you're caught with a knife or robbing someone, you can go do 25 years with one meal a day in the, in the scorching sun. And then what we'll do is we'll put cameras there and we'll interview you once a week and broadcast that out to the nation and see if you change your mind and make people understand that this is a country that should be respected and our laws should be respected. Instead, what happens? What has Sadiq or any of the people in charge of this country actually done to fix any of our issues besides sit around and talk? Nothing. None of them have done anything, but they seem ultra concerned with finding money for proxy wars, ultra concerned with rainbow flags in another country that is uninterested in them, and their priorities are completely messed up. Of course the ambulance people are. Of course the ambulance drivers are striking. Of course the nurses are striking. Nobody cares about the most important things in this nation. It's a failing country in real time, and that's why I've left. What about the specific allegation? By the way, I don't disagree with a lot of that, um, because I do think this country is in big trouble. And I do think that one of the problems is people think if they do have a crime against them, nobody cares anymore. I right? know I know nobody cares. I can I have specific examples and people who I know personally. Absolutely and utterly nobody cares. I was in Harrods yesterday and someone tried to rob someone's watch in the middle of the store. I walk around with six full grown I have a security team of six full grown men, plus me and my brother, eight military age males all over 110 kilos, mm. big men, just so I can walk around this city. It's absolutely unacceptable. What about the issue of race? And I mentioned that in the context of the Harry and Meghan ongoing debate, their war with the royal family, war against the monarchy, their specific uh, constant uh, referencing to the fact that they believe they were driven out of here because of racism in Britain. What do you make of that debate? That, that's absolute fallacy. I and you're from a mixed race... Correct. Background yourself. Correct. I'm from a mixed race background myself. And while we're discussing the leaders of the UK, although I do think they're doing a terrible job, it's kind of hard for Meghan to say that the UK is a racist country when the leader of the UK is darker skinned than her and the mayor of London is darker skinned than her. And I am a person who's probably darker skinned than her. And I've never experienced any kind of bigotry against myself besides the fact I'm a straight male. I'll get bigotry for that before I'll get bigotry for my skin color. I think it's just a cop out and her not wanting to be perspicacious and self-reflective enough to understand that she has attacked an age-old institution, and there are people who are very patriotic about that institution, and by attacking it and bringing a degree of distaste to it, there's going to be people who don't like her. And if you're a dislikable person, you can't just instantly stand up and say it's because of my skin colour. It might because, be because of your actions and some of the things you've said. I mean, I think it's probably no doubt she's had racism on social media because it's... Who a hasn't, it's a, it's a cesspit. You probably have. Well, as I said just now, I've had death threats on social media and no, no, one, no one seemed to care very much. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's probably inarguable. My issue with what they've both been doing is if you're going to make allegations against an institution like the royal family and the monarchy, you've got to actually provide some evidence. You can't just spray gun this thing out there and say, well, somebody was racist. Yeah, and airing dirty laundry is never going to be respected by the populace. 
and being a tattletale is never going to be respected by the populace. And I think the problem with the modern world we're living in is a lot of age-old traditions are being destroyed in real time. It doesn't matter what the tradition is. Most of them are being eroded. And something like the British royal family, which has been around for a very long time, is an age-old tradition. One of the things holding the UK together, one of mm. the last things we have, to sit and detriment it and to sit and insult it and to give away secrets from inside of it and try and paint a, a negative image of it is going to upset a lot of people. And you have to be prepared for that backlash. You can't say I've done things that upset people, but it's nothing to do with what I've done. It's purely because of my skin color. Also, it's kind of ironic that she's doing that because she's not particularly dark skinned. It's kind of funny to sit here, sit here, sit here, I mean, look, watch I her sit and say, yeah, race, 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 I, race. I think the truth is I don't know what, look, you can say that. I can't. Um, the, the reality of it is, I just don't know what the specifics of the racism she says she's had because we've not seen any evidence. The universe is a funny place, Piers. If you're looking for something, you're going to find it, right? When I got cancelled, when they attacked me unfairly, lied about me across the entire mainstream media, deleted me from social media so I couldn't defend myself and lied about me repeatedly, I could have stood up and said, it's because I'm brown. I didn't do that. I sat and said, okay, there's people who misunderstand my message. My message is a, is a positive one. People misunderstand me. Let me self-reflect and understand that, yes, perhaps this said a long time ago was said in the wrong way. Perhaps this was misunderstood. Perhaps people don't understand this. I could have just copped out and could have just been refusing to self-reflect on any level and said, it's because I'm brown, that's why they did it. But that's not the mature way to be as an adult. What did you think of the Jeremy Clarkson furore where he... Wrote what well, I think most people, but including him, uh, belatedly after he'd published it and written the column, he did make a, an analogy from a Game of Thrones uh, scene, which most people I think did find crossed a line and was deeply offensive. I I think it crossed a line. What do you think? Yeah, I understand why people feel that. But when you attack an institution as old as the British royal family, you're attacking patriotism in and of itself for one of the most respected countries or previously most respected countries on earth, and you're going to have some visceral reactions. Perhaps Jeremy Clarkson is, is too famous and too well-renowned to say those kind of things, but there's a lot of people who genuinely feel that way, and that's why he said it. And this is what happens when you attack age-old institutions in any country. Should he have ap apologized? That's a good question. It looks like he did. Personally, I think as a man, you should stand up, say what you mean, mean what you say. I don't think you should ever apologize for anything you've ever said. Even me. What if, you, what if you say something truly then if, 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 very well, offensive and you actually do regret it? If you truly regret it, then yeah, okay, you can apologize. But if at the time you meant it, then the best thing you can do is say, look, I have just changed my mind. I no longer feel that way. But at the time, that's how I felt. And I'm the person who stands, says what he feels. And that's what I felt at the time. And I apologize that offended you. Andrew Tate, we'll be back with you after the break. We'll talk to you about Twitter again. Uh, Elon Musk restoring you to this platform. Has it calmed you down? Are you as controversial on there? Are you mindful? that you're only one false move like Kanye West, for example, away from being removed again. Well, Elon Musk has restored a throng of banned accounts as taking over Twitter with a sworn commitment to free speech. He's also shown he has a line of his own, though. Conspiracy theorist Alex Jones remains banned. Kanye Ye West was reinstated, then banned again for posting a swastika inside a Star of David. Andrew Tate is back too for now, anyway. He was first removed in 2017 for saying women should bear some responsibility as victims of rape. And he hasn't exactly been shy since his reprieve. Let's take a look. Genghis Khan had endless women and 200 children as a reward for conquest, he tweeted. I'm the most searched man on the planet. I've conquered Earth. I'm the highest status male on the planet. Females do not expect loyalty from me. They only expect that of lesser men. Then there was this. Imagine having less than 10 children because you're a... <clears throat> who doesn't have four wives, genetic failures. Finally, if a girl follows me and she's hot and I see a single picture of her in a private jet, it's block. Women can't afford jets. Women are all brokies. Why are you flying around on some man's jet? You should have been a virgin when I met you. Haram. All right, Andrew Tate. Now, you're, you're getting very near the knuckle with some of those tweets. Am I? Will you tell me? I don't think so. I think people can understand they're semi-satirical. I think people can understand... Do you mean them as jokes or do you mean them? It's not that I don't mean them as jokes. I mean... They're a overall public commentary and observation. I do mean what I say. If I were to see a girl on a private plane on Instagram, for example, I would assume that a man put her on that private plane. I would not assume she bought it herself. What if it was... Perhaps Ari that makes me misogynistic. What if it was Ariana Grande or Beyonce? Well, that's slightly different, isn't it? Why? Because they're famous and very they're rich. They're women? Yeah, of course, and they're famous and very rich. But so if there are I, lots of women, if I you saw, wouldn't think that if well, you actually saw them on if a private I saw, Well, if I saw a 19-year-old girl from Moldova where the average wage is $200 a month and she was on a private jet, I would assume that with the balance of probabilities, considering I'm an adult, it's very likely because of her beauty, a man has put her on that private plane. Yes, if that makes me misogynistic instead of just...
perspicacious enough to understand how the world works, so be it. I'm a realist. Should you be such a generalist about these things? Well, you have to be a generalist when you're looking for in the balance of probabilities and trying to find balance in the world. You have to be a generalist. In general, if I stroke a lion, it's going to bite my hand. In general. There might be a nice one, but I don't want to find out. So that's how the world works. You've praised the Taliban in the past. Would you do so again tonight? The world is not black and white. The world is grey. It's very difficult to sit and make black and white assumptions about anything. To sit and say that the Taliban are completely and utterly evil and we're completely and utterly good, as you just discussed with the moral high ground. I believe that the Taliban bring law and order. It may not be the law and order we like, but it's a form of law and order. And humans tra- usually gravitate towards... What about towards... their treatment of women? I mean, only well, tonight... Compl- only tonight they have banned any women from going to university. Fantastic. Let's get the feminists to go and teach them a lesson. The feminists are so tough. And they stand up and say they can do anything a man can do. Let's arm them up and send them to Afghanistan. I'm sure they'll fix it. No, but it's, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a serious matter, isn't it, that women don't uh, that's get a, the education and that, they and deserve? That's, and that's a very serious answer. If women are just as capable as men in terms of combat, like feminists pretend they are, then they can go over there and they can deal with the a Taliban. A lot of women do go to combat. Exactly. So they can go deal with the Taliban. It's nothing to do with me. They can stand up and fight for their own rights. But surely you wouldn't defend the Taliban it, banning women from university. It's saying it's nothing to do with me, Pierce. It's absolutely nothing what to do with me. What about the Afghan women? It's nothing to do with me on any level. You don't have a view? I have a view. My view is that people naturally gravitate towards law and order. And if you didn't have the Taliban, you'd have different warlords operating in lawlessness. And there would be no way to prevent your store, your market stall, getting completely robbed by someone with an AK-47. And people are going to gravitate towards a form of law and order. America left. They left the power vacuum. And the power vacuum is now full. Well, I don't disagree with that. OK. Well, but I do, we think, I do think the banning of women from university in Afghanistan is utterly horrific. And I think the feminists are going to arm themselves. They're going to show us that they can do anything a man can do. They're going to go over there to combat and they're going to teach Taliban a lesson. Why can't you just say on that, you know what, it's completely wrong? Because it's not my point. It's, I don't understand... But it, makes Af- me, it makes me think, it'll make your critics think that you don't think it's wrong. They could ban all men. They could ban all short people. But they're not. They're only banning women. Correct. They could ban all short people. They could ban all people with long hair. None of it's anything to do with me. So they can do whatever they want. I'm not going to go to war with the Taliban. But you've just literally spent an impassioned first segment comparing the way, for example, Dubai handles law and order Correct. to this country. Correct. So you do express views about different laws. Absolutely. Both places... So when like- I put to you a law that basically bans women from being educated... It's not, why is it a problem for you to say, you know what, it's wrong? There are both places I've resided in, Dubai and London, so I have personal experience. I can give my personal opinion, but like I said, it has absolutely nothing to do with me with what the Taliban decide to do inside of Afghanistan. And if they decide that's the most prudent way to run their society, then we have two choices. We can either go over there and start another war that we shouldn't be involved in and waste a bunch of life, or we can sit and say, it's up to them, they should govern themselves, they're people, we're no better than them, and they've decided to live their lives a particular way, and that's how they're going to live it. Like I said, if feminists are very upset and they're very disgusted by the fact that in Afghanistan women cannot go to school, I've been told repeatedly by feminists that they're just as capable as men in all realms, and I I expect them to arm themselves and fly over to Afghanistan and fix it. Like a lot of women have done in combat. Um, Good. Congratulations. Mm. Go fight. Well, this is the thing that's very interesting. Because when you talk about ideas, it's not even just about Afghanistan and feminism. When you talk about ideas, they must all be defended at some point. There has to come down to violence. The world is backed by violence. Nobody wants to talk about this. It doesn't matter what it is. If you have a disagreement between two parties, eventually, if the disagreement continues, it ends up in violence. Feminism is defended by men. Men stand up and defend feminism, not feminists themselves, because they're incapable of violence. And we're in a situation now where you're saying that we should send men to go and fight for feminism. Why? It's not a man's problem. No, I think I'm saying... feminists believe... I think, well, A, I think men can be feminists too, because if feminism believes in equality for women... It's not about equality. I don't agree with radical feminists who hate men. To me, the radical anything to me is a bad thing. Yeah, and I think most feminism in the West currently is radical. Well, some of it is, no yeah. question. Absolutely, but this is my point. My point is that the Taliban are going to do whatever the Taliban decide to do. If I'm going to fly over to another country, I will respect their laws and customs. It's not my job to come along and tell other people how to live. I don't believe I have a moral high ground in that degree. And if people are genuinely upset and disgusted by it, the bottom line in most disagreements on the earth is violence. People who feel like they should go and fix it, then fix it with violence, then it can be the feminists who feel so outraged by it. But it's funny, they don't comment on these subjects, feminists. They seem to instead attack the Western male for some reason. You deleted a video in which you praised ISIS. Why? I don't know which video you're talking about in particular. It might have been a video from a long time ago. But in general, I understand that, like I said, the world is not black and white, the world is grey areas, and Western imperialism as a whole has been causing more problems than it's ever fixed, and it's disgusting. And I don't know the exact video you're referencing, but sometimes when an underdog destroys a Western imperialist, I have 
a degree of, I wouldn't say satisfaction, but every satisfaction. Single, no, but there's a, there's certainly a degree of oh, uh, the, the, uh, the way ISIS. Oh, I don't know the particular. I don't know about the particular video we're talking. Well, about. ISIS were one of the most deadly terror groups in the world. Absolutely, they committed a series of appalling atrocities, sure. killing innocent people left, Completely. right, and centre. Yeah. How could you possibly have satisfaction? Well, I, if it's the video I'm recollecting, if it's the video we're talking about, it's about the fact that I believe ISIS was funded by the West and created by the West in the first place. And it wasn't a degree of satisfaction, like, I'm happy ISIS exists. It was a commentary on the world. Well, here's what you said. ISIS are the real Muslims, because ISIS do exactly what the book says. Kill everyone who's not a Muslim and chop people's heads off and set them on fire and be raging lunatics. But all the other Muslims go, they're not real Muslims because I read the book and ignore those parts. Well, then you're not an effing Muslim because you're ignoring the effing book. That's an interesting, that's an interesting point you've just raised, because I am now Islamic. And it's, it's funny, because I used to be an atheist, and when you're an atheist... You believe that religion causes more problems than it fixes, and then you come to a realization and you start to learn the truth of yourself and the truth of God, and you realize that religion is actually the cure for most of the problems in the world, and godlessness is the problem in the world. So that is something I will apologize for and admit I was wrong about because I was atheistic, and now as a Muslim, I understand that's absolutely not the case. If that's the particular video you're talking about, then... then there's well, that's really interesting. So you, you regret saying that? Yeah, because you learn and you grow and you evolve, as I said. Uh, at the time, I believed it because I didn't believe in God at the time. It was a very long time ago. It's actually kind of a testament to you, Piers. You managed to find the oldest possible videos of me that have ever existed. But at the time, I was atheistic. Well, no, I was curious, because you have recently converted to Islam. Correct. So these questions, I think, are pertinent to your conversion. Absolutely. As to what you actually believe as a practicing Muslim now. Uh, yeah, I believe that Islam is beautiful. I believe it's the last true religion on Earth. It's certainly the last respected religion on Earth. And I felt differently inside since I've converted. And I think it has the solutions to a lot of the problems we're facing in the world today. That particular video was once again satirical. A lot of people watching this would not have seen it. They would not have seen the joke element of it. It's fine. It, but It's not funny, though, is no, it? Well, you know, it's like most of the time, as we discussed in our first interview with me, things are taken out of context, short form, et cetera, et cetera. But all in all, you could say the same things about Christians. If you were to read the Old Testament and say, stick to the Old Testament, you'd kill anyone who works on a Sunday. So... It's not applicable to... You wouldn't countenance violence. violence. Say again? You don't countenance violence. I absolutely do not countenance violence. When I was talking about violence being the bottom line salute, the bottom line decider between dis disagreeing points of view, it's not I'm s calling for violence, I'm just making a commentary on how the world genuinely functions. But when you use a word like satisfaction, you understand that people will watch that and think, how can you possibly find any form of terrorism satisfying? I don't find any form of terrorism satisfying. I don't find Western terrorism satisfying either. I don't think it's satisfying that we managed to find $500,000 per bomb to drop on some farmer who makes $4 a day under the name of freedom. And, well, then no we can't, uh, and, and, and we can't seem to pay our nurses enough to do their jobs. I don't find any kind of terrorism. And it's actually very interesting. You talk about the world terrorism. Terrorist and freedom fighter, good guy and bad guy, all of this is subjective. There are people who believe that the West are the biggest terrorists on the earth. There are people who believe that America causes more wars than anyone else. And they've killed more people than anyone else. And there's people who believe the absolute opposite. So once again, it depends who you're talking to. It's a subjective conversation. There's no black and white in the world. There's areas of gray. And that's how it is. So I thought you were talking about another video where I was saying that ISIS are standing up and fighting for what they believe in. I'm not saying what they believe in is right, but that's what they were fighting for at the time. And it was a completely different video than the one you were actually referencing. But you would condemn them now? I don't condemn anybody doing anything bad to anybody. I, I'm not a person out here with a criminal record. I don't hurt anyone. I just spent my first segment on this show talking about how I believe in law and order and how important that is. I think people can operate inside of their lives safely and walk around. Man, woman, child can walk around in safety in any city they live in. How that law and order is constructed is not my jurisdiction. I'm not in charge of the law and order of, of Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, any of them. It's nothing to do with me. I want to talk to you after the break about masculinity. Why is it that so many young men gravitate to you? What is your view of what it takes to be a man? Welcome back to this special edition of Piers Morgan Uncensored with Andrew Tate, one-on-one. -on -one. So Ash Sarkar, who's a, a lively contributor to this program, has tweeted, Andrew Tate, who you're interviewing about free speech, thinks women are a man's property. We shouldn't be allowed to drive, boast about only dating teenagers to imprint on them. Misogynists are disgusting, whether they're in Afghanistan or a swanky London studio. Am I a misogynist, am I? I don't think... I, first of the things she said, I don't even truly believe. Uh, it's, I can, if you're prepared to listen to me, I'll explain to you exactly why she's utterly and, completely and utterly wrong. If you can go through the points again... She well, said do do you think one. you're a misogynist? Absolutely not. 
I'm not a misogynist on any level. This is one of those buzzwords they throw at and that just throw at people randomly. Homophobic, racist, misogynist, they just throw it out at people. What is I'm, your view of women? I'm a realist. What is I'm, your real view of women? I absolutely not really love women. I adore women. I have good relationships with women. Not a single woman has come up to me on the street since I've been canceled. Not a single one has said anything negative. Every single one of them has said positive things. You're a traditional male. I wish more men were like you. You understand your masculine roles. You understand what you're supposed to do. You understand you're supposed to protect women. You're exactly the kind of man I'd be looking for. I've never had a negative interaction with a female ever since I've been dubbed the biggest misogynist Where in the world. Is the please, please let me finish. I'm sorry, sorry, Pierce. Also, there's not been a single woman who's accused me of a crime, not a single woman who's accused me of rape, not a single woman who's come out and said anything from my entire past of 36 years I've done anything wrong ever. Anybody else with my level of fame, any footballer, any other movie star at least has people who've come out and accused them of rape, X, Y, Z. I have no woman who's come out and ever said I've hurt her. No woman who's come out and ever said I've done damage to her or been horrible to her. Everybody who ever interacted with me has said I've been a nice person. All of them. Here's so this okay. random Twitter nobody who seems to know so much is full of... All right, you, you've responded to her tweet. Yeah, uh, a liar. But here's what, where is the line for you between masculinity, which I will always defend, and which I agree with? I think a lot of women like men to be masculine, and, and what has become known as toxic masculinity. And the reason I ask you is that you are engaged in that debate with men all the time. Where is the line for you where men shouldn't cross, where the behaviour should be kept within a line? Please define toxic masculinity. Well, you tell me what you think it crosses a line from being a masculine good man to a bad man. There's no such thing as too much masculinity if it's genuinely masculine. Genuine masculinity is not out here to hurt people. It's absolutely the opposite. It's out here to protect. And when bad things happen, they call traditionally masculine men. If you need a firefighter, you need a masculine man. When you call the police because of the problem you have, you want masculine men. And as soon as a woman or a man is in trouble, when you look for backup, you look for masculine men. And masculine men have a duty to provide and protect those they care about. We have a duty to do things we don't feel like doing because we know we're supposed to do them. And that's why we stayed in the Titanic and died. Those were masculine where men. Did you, where did you get your views about this from? Just what I grew up with. It's the family I grew up around. And your the, father, and, your mother, Yeah, both? And, and the world I lived in. And I think a lot of the things I'm saying now about masculinity and how people should act and the world how the world should function were considered completely normal and accepted by everybody only 20 years ago. I think the world's just lost its mind. For me to stand up and say a man should protect a woman now gets to be called a misogynist and cancelled. If I said that 10 years ago, everyone would say, duh. And what's funny is, everyone who argues against me and says men shouldn't protect women, especially all the feminists, if they were with their boyfriend and a man broke into their house, guess who they'd expect to go downstairs? Who do you think? Think they go themselves? Are they going to Afghanistan? No, we send men to do these things. So well, we, send women, we send women in the armed forces too. We, you, you have to generalise when you make points. There are many, many courageous exceptions, people... Exceptions women in the do armed not forces. disprove the rule. No, but there, you've got to concede there are many courageous women serving in the armed forces. Absolutely and utterly, completely correct. But by and large, traditionally, soldiers are men. Exceptions do not disprove the rule. Well, it's not an exception. It's a fact that there are a lot of women now in the armed forces. Correct. But if you were to take the average soldier, they are a male if you're allowed to say who's a male and who isn't nowadays. I'm assuming their gender, I apologise. If you were to take the average soldier, they're a male, which means that exceptions are the female soldiers, which, because there's a lower percent of them, a lower probability, exceptions do not disprove the rules. Men do the fighting. What right now in Ukraine, men cannot leave. Women are allowed to leave because men have to fight in the front line and women are allowed to go to Dubai. That is how it is. What do you say to young men who come to you for advice, who feel lost, who don't really know where they fit into society? I say that life as a man is exceptionally difficult. I say the most beautiful and the most terrifying thing about being a man is you're born without value. Society doesn't care about you. You're only going to be cared about based on how useful you are. You have the chance to build yourself up and become a superhero if you're prepared to do the hard work and be indefatigable enough to never quit. But if you're going to stand around and wait for a handout, nobody's going to ever respect you. And I think that a lot of people have forgotten about how difficult and how competitive it is as a man. We're always in constant competition with each other. And it's your duty as a man to stand up and say, I want to be as important and strong and good-hearted and God-fearing as possible, and I need to work hard to achieve those things. Dame Sheila Hancock says we've become too over-emotional as a society, crying too much about everything. Has well, she got a point? She's completely right. And the dangerous thing about overly emotional men is that they're dangerous. They're genuinely dangerous. This is what's crazy. All these people who talk about toxic masculinity and how bad it is for men to be traditionally masculine. A traditionally masculine man does things he doesn't feel like doing because it is his duty to do them. He charges into the burning building because it is his duty. Not because he feels like it, because it is his duty. We're now teaching the new generation of men that they don't have duty and they can just act on their feelings and act how they feel and they don't have to act as a man should. Do you know what happens when you get men who just act how they feel? 
you get school shooters, you get violence, you get rapists. Men who do not control their emotions are dangerous. If you find a man who is stoic, he's not going to hurt people. He's going to sit and think about his actions very carefully, and he's going to be a good man who protects for, and provides for his family. You find a man who just acts out on impulse and does whatever he feels like, you're going to find a dangerous man. Sitting here telling men to cry more and act with their feelings and it's okay to feel this way, that way, etc., and have no self-control. That is why we have the problems we have in the world. Absolutely not wrong. So when they talk about toxic masculinity, they have it completely inversed on its head. Completely not wrong. We need to be teaching stoicism. We need to be teaching young men to understand that the world is very, very difficult. It's hard to be a man. You're going to feel bad sometimes. You just suck it up and perform anyway. Not to sit there you cry your eyes out or blame other people. Tough or being cop a out. woman too in modern society. It's certainly tough being a woman, but I'm not a woman, so why would I speak on issues I do not understand? I'm a man. You can feel so, an empathy for women. I feel empathy, certainly, but I do not understand their issues. See, a lot I, of men come up to me and they admire you. I've got to say, a lot of women... I've spoken to don't admire. They think you represent misogyny. They think when they hear you not commit to saying the Taliban shouldn't be banning women from university education, well, why can't he just say that's wrong? Well, firstly, that's not my experience. I experienced the absolute and utter opposite of that. Secondly, it's because it's a moral point I'm making. My moral point is I speak on things I understand. I speak on experiences I've had. Would you I believe on, in equality? I speak on, yes. I speak on, uh, sure. I speak on subjects I know intimately. I do not feel qualified. I'm a realist, and I do not feel qualified to sit and discuss the gender laws in Afghanistan. I have not been to Afghanistan. I have not researched the subject thoroughly. I'm not going to sit here and say how they have Taliban should be running their country. It's nothing to do with me. I find it quite flattering, Piers, that although, you know, I understand I'm monumentally influential, the most Google man on earth, etc., I find it very flattering that you think I have some kind of control over the domestic policy of Afghanistan. But I assure you I don't. I don't. No, no, so I'm, it's not, nothing to do I'm with not asking you to have a view on having uh, influence of a domestic policy. I'm sure the Taliban couldn't give us stuff what either of us say about it. Um, it's just curious to me that it's an easy win for you to make women think you're not anti them, to say that when they're not given equality, as the women in Afghanistan clearly are not, because they're not allowed to go to university now, as of today, that is clearly unequal, unfair. We should all be able to agree that that is wrong. Well... Certainly, as a realist... Even you, tough guy, I, I, Andrew. It's Tate. not a tough guy. I am a professional. As a professional, I can state that, yes, it is not equal. Yes, it is not fair. That is obvious for anybody. I'm not saying those things are not true. What I'm saying is, it's nothing to do with me. Right, OK, but you made a concession you think is wrong. It's wrong then. I said it's unequal and it's unfair. Yeah, so wrong. Well, perhaps... And, Force and, yourself, Andrew. No, perhaps it's wrong under certain moral guidelines, but under the moral guidelines which are currently in charge of the jurisdiction of Afghanistan. They don't believe it's wrong. It's nothing to do with me. Well, then I, I'm not going to sit here and tell other countries how to run their laws. I'm going to live in societies which, with right. laws I'll I take respect. A, you know what? I'll take unfair and unequal. Sure. Because that's self-explanatory. We're going to have a game of chess in a minute after the break because you are a very good chess player. I can hold my own in the chess pool. Your father was a chess uh, international master, uh, in fact. And we're going to have a five-minute game of speed chess. Winner takes all, Mr. Tate. Welcome back to Pittsburgh on Sense. And Andrew Tate is still here. Andrew's father was an American chess international master, and his son's pretty good at it too. Well, I can hold my own as my school chess champion. Uh, and with five minutes left on the program, we're going to have a game of speed chess. Winner takes all. All right, but well, you're white. Off you go. That's racist. Off we go. Five minutes. Go. That's racist, Piers. Cancel, Piers Morgan. <laughs> okay. Are you good, Piers? Well, clearly, are you going to destroy me? Clearly, from this opening, better than you. Uh, OK, let's be aggressive, shall we? School chess champion, eh? Mm-hmm. It's tense. Certainly. Lennox Lewis was better than you when I played him. Was he? Well, he beat me 39 times out of 40. Check. Yeah, he is uh, pretty good at the game, I heard. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Time to get aggressive with you, Mr. Tate. Show you a bit of toxic chess masculinity. Well, the world's been pretty aggressive with me lately, Piers, so uh, I'm used to it. It's fine. Uh -huh. OK. Oops, apologize. How long we got? Why do you think the queen... 3.45. Why do you think the queen gets to jump across the board and the king doesn't? Because it's sexist. The game of chess is sexist, but perhaps it reflects life, Piers. Haven't you ever thought 
that when you look at a yacht in Dubai... You're running out of time. Oh. Stop stalling. I know what you're Fine, doing. I'll just take your queen. Oh, God! I'll just take your queen. Damn it. I was trying to give you a little speech there. You didn't want to listen to it. No, I was trying I to tell you when you see a yacht in Dubai, the girl just gets an Instagram invite, gets to jump right on board. She so gets listen. to run across the board and do whatever she wants, but the man has to get there a square at a time. The man had to buy that yacht. That's the difference between being a man and being a woman. That's why the queen gets you to know do what? how she does. A chivalrous man just always lets ladies go first. Life and chess That's reflect. That's why I let you go first. Life and chess reflect, Piers. Mm-hmm. I've made a catastrophic error, but I'm bouncing back. Let's see. I always accidentally take someone's chick. Three minutes. I don't even mean to. It's just like, oops. <laughs> you need to stop knocking my pieces over like some... Doug. Yeah, exactly. He's not getting in my head. They're talking to me saying you're getting in my head. Um... How do you think chess reflects life? I think that it's all about strategy. Correct that if you're good at chess, you can be good at pretty much anything because it's about thinking ahead, it's about planning, it's about relentless practice. And you know what else is beautiful about chess? Mm -hmm. If you lose, somewhere you made a mistake. There is no luck. Absolutely right. In chess, even if it's the smallest mistake, somewhere it was your fault. It teaches absolute self-accountability, which is something that we need a lot more of in the world today. That is true. And that's why chess is so important. You can take my knight if you want. You don't want it? Why do you want my knight? Uh, Because I'm playing a long game. Oh, okay. I thought you'd want it. I'm going to leave it there in case you take it anyway. Okay. I'm going to go... Because I know what you want me to do. I'm not going to do it. Actually, I will do it now. Okay, good. Check. (laughs) Uh... Check. 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 How long? (laughs) I need to buy some time here. I need to buy some time. Uh, this is really playing well on radio, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have that. Thank Damn you. it! Uh, uh, I'm screwed. I'm screwed. I'm Don't a, say that. How long Pierce. have I got? One you minute twelve. Believe in yourself. Oh, I never ever give up. Believe in yourself. Pierce. I do believe in myself. Thank you. Good. Self belief is important. I do believe in myself, but this has not gone well. You're quite good at chess, I'll give you that. Yeah, well, in the chessboard of life, I've done pretty good. Mm. I've done okay. Mm-hmm. Check. The question is, can you beat me in time? You've only got 50 seconds. Check. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. I don't think you can. Let's see. Uh, mm. Mate in two, peers. Yeah, you can have that. doesn't matter. It's mate in two. Check. Mate. Good game. Ah! Good game, sir. Well played. Thank you. 25 seconds away from safety. OK, well, Andrew Tate, I'll give you something. Uh, you're good at chess. Thank you. I'll see you it. have to be. You just beat me. <laughs> I know you're a national, internationally renowned What has player. chess taught you about life, quickly? I can teach you a lot of things. Like I said about the queen being able to run around the board, the king having to move a square at a time, about the fact you need to think ahead, absolutely everything is your fault. But there is a saying, which is actually one of my favorite sayings in the world. It said, a, well-gamed, a well-played game of chess is the sign of a gentleman, but an expertly, gamed, expertly played game of chess is the sign of a wasted life. And it's kind of sad. It was I, play, I played Lennox Lewis in, on Celebrity Apprentice 39 times out of 40 in America years ago. And he, he beat me 39 times out of 40, I mean. Uh, and I was amazed. He was taught by his mum. But he was all about the, the way he fought, the way he boxed, yeah. was all down to the way he played chess. Yeah, chess. It was all about looking ahead... Getting ahead of your opponent, planning, planning punches, you know, all that kind of thing. Chess absolutely reflects life. And even I say this now in my business meetings with my team. A lot of the problem in the world today, especially with teams and businesses, etc., everyone wants to be the king. But if you want to have a team, if you want to have a side that wins, if you want to win a game of chess, everybody has to know their role and do their role effectively. There can be a king and a rook and a pawn and a bishop and a knight, and everyone does everything correctly. And when that happens, you have a very formidable board and you're hard to beat. And uh, chess reflects life absolutely. It's something I do every single day. What kind of man was your father? He was the greatest man on the face of the planet. But uh, luckily he had me, and now, in the natural order of the universe, he is gone, and I am here, and I carry his name, and it is my duty to bring honor to him. And this is one of the greatest things about achievement, because achievement honors your ancestors. People talk about my father because of how successful I am. And people will talk about me into eternity, even after my death, because of how successful uh, my son will be. This is the great thing about achievement. It's an honor to your ancestors. What would he have made of your success, your father? He would be extremely... 
underwhelmed by it because he always expected it of me. I am Emory Andrew Tate III. I can do whatever I put my mind to. And he would be like, well, of course, you decided you wanted to become the most famous man on the planet. It took you a few months, of course. Does your, does your mother ever do what my mother does and occasionally go, I think you went too far there? My mother has absolute trust in my abilities and capabilities. She says, be careful, do your best, but you are the most capable and competent man on the planet. And that I wasn't the question. That, that's what she says. She says, Did, be careful. Does she ever say you shouldn't have said that? Nah, she knows better than that. Really? Go no, never. She says, you're, just be careful. You know what you're doing. It's kind of hard to argue against me, and this is what my haters seem to struggle with. It's hard to argue against a person who is monumentally successful in every single human metric that can possibly be measured. This is why young men respect me so much. They but want do you ever to tell be, your mother what to do? They want to be my life. Do you ever tell her what to do? I don't need to. She's a full-grown woman. Would you ever tell her what to do? I would give her my advice if she asked for it. You say you can't leave opinion. the home, you can't drive, all those things you joke about? Or? I would give her my I'd give her my opinion. I would say perhaps you should move house now or perhaps that's not safe. Or Yeah, I would absolutely because I'm responsible for her safety. And when you're responsible for somebody's safety, you have an opinion and you need to have a firm opinion on that subject. So completely. For any woman I am responsible for, for any woman I am responsible for her safety, I will sit and say that's an unsafe thing to do. How much are you worth? I'm a billionaire by now. Dollars or pounds? About dollars. We're not in pounds yet, but we'll right. get there soon. So what to do? Yeah, we have a, a little bit of work to do. But and finally, I know you don't know anything about football and care even less, but greatest of all time, Ronaldo or Messi? They're both two very hardworking men, and I have absolute respect for anybody on earth who dedicates themselves to this. Andrew Tate, thank you very much indeed. That's it for tonight. Keep it uncensored like it was tonight.